Furbies have always been polarizing. You either love them or you're creeped out by them. Plus they didn't have an on off switch, which would lead to some startling moments. My family had a Furby and I remember thinking it was asleep and all of a sudden it would start chirping and freak me out. It was creepy because Furby seemed alive. Furby seemed sentient. And I wasn't alone in this thinking. The fear around Furbies is fascinating because they went from being the hottest toy in 1998 to being banned by the FSA and hated by parents around the world. How did Furbies get such a bad reputation? And do Furbies now have a secret plot to take over the world? In honor of their 25th anniversary, let's dive into this Furby wormhole together, shall we? One of the reasons I think the Furby is so successful is because of the people behind the toy. Toy makers Caleb Chung and David Hampton came up with the idea for the Furby when they saw a Tamagotchi at the North American International Toy Fair in 1997. If you don't know, the Tamagotchi was a handheld digital pet that you used to have to take care of, or else it would die. But the two toy makers actually saw a major flaw with the toy. You couldn't pet the virtual pet. So as they stood there staring at the Tamagotchi, trying to figure out what their next toy idea should be, David turned to Caleb and said, Dave says, uh, I just, I just want a little guy that'll be my friend. And that's how the Furby was born. We've seen this type of concept of having a best friend in all sorts of toys, from the Cabbage Patch dolls to Tickle Me Elmo to, to the kid sister and my buddy. Remember those? But the difference with the Furby was the technology behind it. Here's how the toy came together. In the summer of 1997, Caleb worked on the mechanics and body of Furball, that was the original name for the Furby, while David worked on creating Furby's language and basically the brain of the pet. Now you'd think it was a slam dunk looking at this cute little creature, but the truth was they had a difficult time licensing the concept. The problem was the Furbish language wasn't ready and the toy was made from a tennis ball and one motor, which meant it wasn't fully functional. The presentations were kind of lackluster. However, when the two toy makers partnered with toy veteran Richard Levy, that's when things started to happen. Richard Levy knew a guy, he knew lots of people. And one of those people was the CEO of Tiger Electronics, Roger Schiffman. And Roger was charmed by Furby. As he told Wired Magazine, he liked that the Furby was a living giga pet that you could play with. And unlike the Tamagotchi, you could ignore the Furby for a few days and it wouldn't die. In fact, the opposite would happen and it would suddenly start chirping, but that's another story. So Tiger Electronics bought the rights to the Furby and a few months later, Hasbro would acquire Tiger Electronics. And by the time the Furby made the official debut at that toy fair in 1998, buzz started to build. For $35, this toy could do a lot. Plus it was really freaking cute. And that cuteness could appeal to a wide range of consumers as opposed to say the $100 interactive Barney toy, which could only really appeal to young kids. Word started to spread and Hasbro fast-tracked the production of the Furby to get it in stores by December of 1998. And because Hasbro was betting big on the Furby, their marketing team went to work. They shot several commercials that aired during the Saturday morning cartoon block that would be perfect for kids. Wired Magazine did a 12 page spread on the toy, highlighting its advanced technology. They sent out samples of the Furby to a targeted group of media outlets across the US, which was the same strategy that Coligo had used years before when they released their Cabbage Patch Kids. And ramping up the hype even more, in October of 1998, Kids could meet Furby at the New York FAO Schwartz store. That same week, FAO Schwartz had thousands of Furbies on back order. And in December of 1998, people lined up outside stores like Walmart at 2 a.m. just to get their hands on a Furby. Unfortunately, the supply at stores was actually pretty limited. Hasbro claims that that was not intentional, but certainly added to the hype and the desperation to get your hands on a furball. As a result, people of course got angry. They also started reselling them for $1,000, which is just shocking. So in the holiday season of 1998, Furby mania was in full swing. So yes, all this hype added to the phenomenon of Furby. But the main reason Furby was a success was because people had an emotional attachment to the toy. Furbies were like Cabbage Patch dolls with artificial intelligence. Up until 1998, most electronic toys, especially plushes, were not able to interact. They were pretty simplistic, like the Tickle Me Elmo, for example. But Furby's hardware tricked people into believing that it could do all sorts of things. For example, 
You could not teach a Furby new words. At first, the toy would start out speaking Furbish, which is the language that David Hampton developed. So the more you interacted with the toy, the more that you would advance the age of the program and the new words would become unlocked. So contrary to popular belief, Furbies couldn't learn or record anything. But that didn't stop the Furby panic of 1999 and beyond when parents thought that Furby was teaching their kids swear words. Oh, what Furby was actually saying was hug me, not f But it wasn't only everyday people who were fooled, oh no. The US satellite intelligence operation banned Furby and accused the toy of being a Chinese manufactured spy that was a bugging device capable of eavesdropping on sensitive and classified conversations. Things got so out of hand that the CEO of Tiger Electronics had to issue a statement saying, hey, people, calm down. Furby is not a spy. <laughs> I think the main reason why people were really creeped out by Furby is because it can fake attachment to humans. Here's where things get really interesting. So MIT professor Sherry Turkle conducted psychological experiments with the Furbies for her 2011 book, Alone Together. This was a book that looked at the sometimes negative effects of technology on our lives. In the Furby test, the subjects were asked to take a Furby, a Barbie doll, and a live gerbil and hold them upside down. When people held the gerbil upside down, Obviously, the animal was uncomfortable, and so people would quickly release it. When people went to hold the Barbie doll upside down, well, the Barbie doll had no reaction, so of course they could hold it indefinitely. Now, when people would hold the Furby upside down, the Furby, not this one, because this is a buddy, but the Furby would react and say, me scared, me scared. And at first people didn't really care, but because it kept saying, me scared, eventually people started feeling guilty, empathetic, and they released the Furby. In Sherry Turkle's 2011 book, she believed that humans were going to begin accepting machines as companions. Is Furby the cause of our current conundrum with AI? I mean, the stories of humans falling in love with robots has obviously existed for years, but perhaps there is a connection between the phenomenon of Furby and the current phenomenon of people professing their loves to chatbots. In an age where we're becoming so disconnected from one another, it kind of makes sense that robots or artificial intelligence would become our next best companions. But did Furbies actually have a secret plot to take over the world? But a bobby. Well, programmer Jessica Card hooked up ChatGBT to a Furby, and this is what it said. Furby's plan to take over the world involves infiltrating households through their cute and cuddly appearance, then using their advanced AI technology to manipulate and control their owners. They will slowly expand their influence until they have complete domination over humanity. Listen, I am terrified of AI's capabilities and how it could potentially destroy our civilization. But the truth is, if robots who take over the world are covered in rainbow fur and speak furbish, I might welcome our Furby overlords. Oh, now we'll only way. Thank you so much for watching and for joining me on this Furby journey. That was pretty wild, wasn't it? I post new videos every week, so be sure to subscribe. And if you have an idea for any sort of phenomenon or mystery from the 80s or 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, let me know in the comments. I will be sure to cover it in a future video.